From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! In addition to what we already know, any full accounting must also find out what, if any, contacts, communications, or connections occurred between Russia and those associated with the campaigns themselves. I will not prejudge the outcome of our investigation. We are seeking to determine if there is an actual fire, but there is clearly a lot of smoke. Ten weeks ago today, President Trump was sworn in as the nation's 45th president. Today, he faces a growing crisis over allegations his campaign colluded with Russia ahead of the 2016 election. This comes as his former national security adviser, Michael Flynn, is reportedly seeking immunity from prosecution in exchange for his testimony to the FBI and congressional investigators. We'll speak with Professor Robert David English, who wrote a piece for foreign affairs called Russia Trump and a new detente. Then, U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is meeting with NATO after his visit to Turkey yesterday, despite concerns Turkey is sliding towards a dictatorship. I'm deeply honored and proud as a representative of the American people to pay my respects to the Turkish nation and to this great leader. Finally, are immigration agents targeting undocumented organizers for their political work? That's the question many are asking after three prominent immigrant rights activists in Vermont were jailed by ICE. We speak with two of them after their release. I am sure that they sought me out because of the work I am doing to defend human rights and not for anything else, because they, what they wanted to do was get into the community and intimidate us that way. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Donald Trump's former national security adviser, Michael Flynn, is seeking immunity from prosecution in exchange for his testimony to the FBI and congressional investigators probing the Trump campaign's alleged ties to Russia. That's according to a report Thursday in The Wall Street Journal. In a statement, Flynn's lawyer said, quote, General Flynn certainly has a story to tell, and he very much wants to tell it should the circumstances permit." Unquote. General Flynn was fired from his cabinet post in February for failing to disclose talks with Russia's ambassador before Trump took office. He's also accused of being paid $65,000 by companies linked to Russia in 2015. Flynn's bid for immunity follows his remarks last September blasting Clinton campaign staffers for accepting immunity in exchange for their testimony to the FBI about Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. Five people around her have had have been given immunity, to include her former chief of staff. When you are given immunity, that means that you've probably committed a crime. News of Flynn's bid for immunity came as the Senate Intelligence Committee opened hearings Thursday on Russia's role in the 2016 election and its alleged ties to the Trump campaign. This is Virginia Democratic Senator Mark Warner, vice chair of the committee. In addition to what we already know, any full accounting must also find out what, if any, contacts, communications, or connections occurred between Russia and those associated with the campaigns themselves. I will not prejudge the outcome of our investigation. We are seeking to determine if there is an actual fire, but there is clearly a lot of smoke. Thursday's hearing focused less on the Trump campaign's alleged dealings with Russia and more on how Russia used what one lawmaker described as propaganda on steroids to influence the election and to undermine the U.S. media. Meanwhile, The New York Times reports two White House officials met secretly with Republican House Intelligence Chair Devin Nunes last week on the White House grounds to show him secret U.S. intelligence reports. Nunes said the documents indicated Trump or his associates might have been incidentally swept up in surveillance carried out by American spy agencies as they conducted foreign surveillance. On the day after the secret meeting, Nunes, who served on Trump's transition team, 
Biden held a news conference, then traveled back to the White House to supposedly brief the president about the documents the president's own staff had given him. On Thursday, the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, California Congressman Adam Schiff, responded to the revelations about the documents shown to Nunes. It raised a profound question why they were not directly provided to the White House by the national security staff uh, and instead were provided through a circuitous route involving the chairman. Um, if that was designed to hide the origin of the materials, uh, that raises profound questions about just what the White House is doing. Nunes is facing increasing calls to recuse himself from the House intelligence probe. We'll have more on the investigation into alleged ties between Trump officials and Russia after headlines. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is in Brussels today for talks with NATO officials, one week after reversing a decision to skip the negotiations. The NATO trip comes on the heels of Tillerson's visit to Turkey, where he heaped praise on the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. In the United States, the people of Turkey have a trusted ally and a partner who is committed to its safety and security and advancing economic opportunity. We look forward to approaching these challenges together, and the Trump administration, administration will continue to build ties with this longstanding ally and our friend. Tillerson's praise comes as Turkey is set to hold a referendum on a constitutional overhaul that would give sweeping powers to President Erdogan and extend his presidency to 2029. The measure would enable the president to issue decrees, declare emergency rule, appoint ministers and top state officials, and dissolve parliament. Back in the United States and North Carolina, Republican lawmakers moved rapidly Thursday to repeal HB2, the so-called bathroom bill, replacing it with a measure that LGBTQ groups blasted as wholly inadequate. Under House Bill 142, transgender people will be able to use the bathroom matching their gender identity, but the law prohibits municipal governments from enacting anti-discrimination ordinances through 2020 and denies employment and housing protections to the LGBTQ community. Democratic Governor Roy Cooper quickly signed the legislation Thursday, calling it an imperfect deal. In a perfect world, with a good General Assembly, we would have repealed House Bill 2 fully today and added full statewide protections for LGBT North Carolinians. Unfortunately, our supermajority Republican legislature will not pass these protections. In a statement, Mara Kiesling of the National Center for Transgender Equality said, quote, The story of HB2 and its disastrous consequences started with former Governor McCrory, but the way it continues is on Governor Cooper's shoulders. Unfortunately, his decision to sign HB142 today was a turn in the wrong direction, unquote. The North Carolina governor's signature came on Thursday's deadline set by the NCAA for the repeal of HB2. The Collegiate Sports Association said its governing board was reviewing the new law and would soon decide whether to extend a boycott of tournaments worth billions of dollars to North Carolina's economy. President Trump scheduled to sign a pair of executive orders today. One aims to establish a commission to study the causes of U.S. trade deficits. The others aimed at tightening anti-dumping laws that restrict foreign manufacturers from undercutting the prices of U.S. goods. The orders are largely aimed at China and come as the White House announced President Trump will host Chinese President Xi Jinping next Thursday and Friday at Trump's resort in Mar-a-Lago, Florida. The meeting's unlikely to include any tea time on Trump's Mar-a-Lago golf course. As president, she has closed over 100 golf courses across China, where the Communist Party officially bans its members from playing the game. President Donald Trump lashed out Thursday at right-wing Republicans who voted against his health care legislation, saying he was prepared to support primary challengers to House Freedom Caucus members in next year's midterm elections. In a tweet, Trump wrote, quote, The Freedom Caucus will hurt the entire Republican agenda if they don't get on the team and fast. We must fight them and Dems in 2018, exclamation point. On Capitol Hill, House Speaker Paul Ryan said he was sympathetic to Trump's view. Look, I understand the president's frustration. I, I share frustration. Um, about 90 percent of our conference is for this bill to repeal and replace Obamacare. 
and about 10 percent are not. Um, and that's not enough to pass a bill. We're close. Members of the Freedom Caucus shot back at Trump, accusing him of siding with the D.C. establishment and failing on a campaign pledge to drain the swamp in Washington. On Capitol Hill, Vice President Mike Pence cast a tie-breaking vote in the Senate Thursday to undo Obama-era rules preventing states from withholding federal funds to women's health clinics that provide abortions. All but two Republicans, Susan Collins of Maine and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, voted in favor of the measure, but few Republicans joined Senate debate Thursday. This is Democratic Senator Patty Murray of Washington. The deafening silence from the group of almost entirely male Republican senators who are voting today to make it harder for women to get the health care they need. Not one spoke today to justify this vote. Where are those Republican senators, Mr. President? Why did they feel so entitled not just to interfere with women's health care decisions, but to do so without explaining themselves? In Iowa, Republican state lawmakers have advanced a bill that would ban all abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. During a House committee debate Wednesday, Republican Shannon Lundgren answered yes when asked if the legislation would require a woman to carry a dead fetus to term if she miscarries after 20 weeks. Iowa's House Republican caucus later said Lundgren misspoke and that the bill allows for an abortion under such circumstances. Meanwhile, in Arkansas, a bill signed into law Wednesday by Governor Asa Hutchinson will require doctors to try to interrogate patients about the sex of their fetus before they're allowed to have an abortion. Doctors will also need to attempt to obtain a woman's medical records before proceeding. The law is ostensibly aimed at preventing sex-selective abortions, but pro-choice groups say it's aimed at adding more obstacles to abortions. In Pakistan, a blast tore through a Shia mosque today, in a remote part of the country's northwest, near the Afghanistan border. The attack killed scores of people and left 60 others wounded. There was no immediate claim of responsibility, though past attacks by Sunni extremists have targeted Shia worshippers in the region. Venezuela's Supreme Court says it'll take legislative power away from Congress, ruling late Wednesday that opposition lawmakers are in contempt of court for swearing in three lawmakers banned over charges of voter fraud. The ruling consolidated President Nicolas Maduro's grip on power and drew outrage from opposition lawmakers. In Caracas, the president of the National Assembly, Julio Borges, tore up a copy of the Supreme Court's order, calling it trash. It is a coup in every possible way. It is a dictatorship, and the entire world needs to help Venezuela right now. Sound the alarm in every democratic nation of the world. Opposition parties are planning mass street demonstrations across Venezuela this weekend to protest the court's ruling. The head of the Organization of American States called the ruling a self-inflicted coup. The ruling comes as Venezuela grapples with a high inflation and deep recession, which has led to shortages of food, medicine and other necessary goods. In South Korea, ousted President Park Geun-hye was arrested Friday and jailed while she awaits trial on charges of bribery, extortion and abuse. Of power. Park was removed from office earlier this month after an impeachment fight that spawned massive protests across South Korea. In Washington, D.C., police have charged two members of an anti-Arab extremist group with hate crimes after they were captured on video, brutally beating a Palestinian-American school teacher. The assault occurred last Sunday outside a conference center where AIPAC, the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee, was holding its annual meeting. In the video, members of the JDL, the Jewish Defense League, are seen waving yellow flags as they surround 55-year-old Kamal Naifeh before kicking and punching and beating him with a flagpole. The assault left Naifeh hospitalized with a badly bloodied eye. The Southern Poverty Law Center says the JDL has a history of bombings and was a classified as a right-wing terrorist group by the FBI. And in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, Palestinians throwing rocks clashed with Israeli soldiers Thursday, who responded with volleys of tear gas and rubber-coated bullets. The protests came on land day, marking the anniversary of the 1976 killing of six Palestinians protesting the Israeli confiscation of Arab land. This is Palestinian activist Abdullah Abu Rahman.
This comes as Israel's security cabinet voted late Thursday to approve construction of Israel's first new settlement in the occupied West Bank in over two decades. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Ten weeks ago today, President Trump was sworn in as the nation's 45th president. Today, he is facing a growing crisis over allegations his campaign colluded with Russia ahead of the 2016 election. On Thursday, there were a number of developments. Trump's former national security adviser, General Michael Flynn, is reportedly seeking immunity from prosecution in exchange for testimony to the FBI and Congress. Flynn was fired from his cabinet post in February for failing to disclose talks with Russia's ambassador before Trump took office. Flynn is also accused of being paid $65,000 by companies linked to Russia in 2015. Meanwhile, The New York Times has revealed one of Flynn's former aides was one of two White House officials to secretly meet with Republican House Intelligence Chair Devin Nunes last week on the White House grounds to show him secret U.S. intelligence reports. Nunes said the documents indicated Trump or his associates might have been incidentally swept up in surveillance carried out by U.S. spy agencies as they conducted foreign surveillance. On the day after the secret meeting, Nunes, who served on Trump's transition team, held a press conference, then traveled back to the White House to supposedly brief the president about the documents the president's own staff had given him. The New York Times identified Nunes' sources as Ezra Cohen Watnick, the senior director for intelligence at the National Security Council, who once worked for Michael Flynn, and Michael Ellis, a lawyer in White House counsel's office, who was previously counsel to Nunes' committee. While Nunes is now facing calls to recuse himself um, from chairing the House intelligence probe into Trump's ties to Russia, the Senate Intelligence Committee held its first public hearing Thursday on the issue. The hearing focused less on the Trump campaign's alleged dealings with Russia and more on how Russia used what one lawmaker described as propaganda on steroids to influence the election and to undermine the U.S. media. During the hearing, Democratic Senator Mark Warner said, quote, we're seeking to determine if there's an actual fire but so far, there is a great, great deal of smoke. To talk more about these developments and what it means for U.S.-Russian relations, we're joined by Robert David English, professor of international relations at University of Southern California. He recently wrote a piece for foreign affairs called Russia, Trump and a New Detente. Professor English is author of Russia and the Idea of the West. So, <clears throat> Professor English, talk about what's happening right now in Washington, D.C. Well, I can't speak in great detail about the allegations. Trump administration officials had improper business ties or colluded with the Russian government or Russian intelligence in meddling in the election. Uh, I await these investigations in Washington turning serious. So far, as one of your uh, commenters said, there's more smoke than fire, and we see the committee members fighting with each other and a lot of partisanship in Washington, so we're not any closer to the truth. What's distressing, what's concerning is that this is the show instead of a serious discussion of U.S.-Russian relations and how we might improve them. Things that candidate uh, Trump, you know, back when he was a candidate for president and campaigning, fairly reasonably outlined uh, that uh, he sought better relations, that the U.S. and Russia could cooperate on a broad range of issues, and essentially that we would meet them halfway. This is now vanished in this political haze and infighting in Washington. So, <clears throat> you have, um, the, in the committee's opening remarks, uh, Mark Warner saying Russia sought to hijack our democratic process. Um, he described it as Russian propaganda on steroids designed to poison the national conversation in America. Your response? I think that's somewhat overstated. Based on what we know publicly, at least, um, again, what do we have? We have the hacking into the Democratic National Committee and release of some emails that contain nothing classified, national security related, but were embarrassing because they exposed some kind of internal corruption or misdeeds in the Democratic Party. We also have, of course, 
what he's calling propaganda on steroids. That would be Russian state TV, the RT, RT or Sputnik networks, uh, as well as various internet sources that certainly are propagandistic. Uh, the problem for me in Warner's remarks is that these vehicles reach so few people, right? RT has a minuscule portion of the American or European television market, and same with the others, that this kind of propaganda can be as high on steroids as it wants to be. It's just not having much impact. So I wish the committees would get past this rehashing of what's already been said a dozen times in various intelligence reports, you know, and exaggerated and get to the heart of the matter. Was there illegal collusion? Was there cooperation between the Trump administration campaign or future officials and the Russian government? Right now, it's just sort of rehashing and inflaming, um, you know, a lot of smoke, but still very little fire. I want to turn to comments by Florida Republican Senator Marco Rubio, who revealed during Thursday's Senate Intelligence Committee hearing that he was the target of Russian hacks right then, he and his former presidential staff. In July of 2016, uh, shortly after I announced that I would seek re-election to the United States Senate, former members of my presidential campaign team. Uh, who had access to the internal information of my presidential campaign were targeted by IP addresses uh, with an unknown location within Russia. That effort was unsuccessful. I'd also informed the committee that within the last 24 hours, uh, at 10.45 a.m. yesterday, uh, a second attempt was made, uh, again, against former members of my presidential campaign team who had access to our internal information, again, targeted from an IP address from an unknown location in Russia. And that effort was also unsuccessful. Professor Robert David English, uh, can you comment on this? No, I can't uh, possibly know what that consisted of. Um, it may be true. Uh, there are a lot of explanations for false flags or IP addresses that leave a trail in one place when it's coming from another. I don't know what uh, information in Marco Rubio's email or those of his staff would be of interest to this or that hacker. Um, you know, I can't. I simply can't comment on the details of something that was just revealed of this sort. Um, if it's part of a broad pattern, of course, it's disturbing. Um, again, it didn't turn the election. It was one of many factors, and um, maybe this is a, a moment, right? Maybe the real conclusion here is let's step back and consider Russia's meddling in our politics and our meddling in their politics, of which there is also plenty, and, and address the sort of brave new world of cyber threats and, and this kind of intersection of propaganda, news, public affairs, secrecy, surveillance in a more comprehensive way. You know, we have the best cyber war capabilities in the world. Believe me, we're not pure as well. Um, but as far as Rubio, who knows? I can't know until, again, all of these investigations get to some substance and not just momentary allegations. Well, let me <clears throat> go finally to uh, General Flynn, uh, the former national security adviser. His bid for immunity following his remarks last September blasting Clinton campaign staffers for accepting immunity in exchange for their testimony to the FBI about Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. People around her have had have been given immunity to include her former chief of staff. When you are given immunity, that means that you've probably committed a crime. Also, at one of Donald Trump's campaign rallies last year, Trump himself referred to claims Clinton had been granted immunity by saying, the reason they get immunity is because they did something wrong. If they didn't do anything wrong, they don't think in terms of immunity. Um, <clears throat> so the significance of Flynn. Uh, appealing for immunity, if he is to speak to Congress or the FBI, and what you think he has to say. And then we'll talk about this bigger picture of <clears throat> what a number of people are calling Russian hysteria. I can't possibly know, we can't know, what it is that General Flynn may be worried he'd be liable to prosecution for. Um, based on what's publicly available, likely as not, it has to do with monies he received, consulting fees, payments uh, for appearances from Russian state television or, or for other services. 
as it does to um, sort of political collusion. We know that he was a guest of Russian state television, that he'd given various addresses, received various consulting fees. It could simply have to do with him proper use of money. Again, how can I possibly know? Um, but what would really matter to us is if there was what some suspect collusion, right, that the Trump campaign people, future administration officials like Flynn, knew about the email hacking, actually coordinated in the release of those emails to maximally embarrass Hillary Clinton and tilt the campaign. That's the smoking gun. That's the real crime, if it's there. If there was improper use of money, if, you know, if Paul Manafort has money as Cypriot Bank, if he worked or others took fees for consulting for some shady oligarchs, that's a different matter already. That sounds a lot like Halliburton and other oil money in the George W. Bush administration. Not nice, but not extraordinary. It's the political collusion that we can't know about that's the real bombshell, if indeed it exists. <clears throat> Professor, you wrote Russia, Trump and a New Detente, and you started by saying in his first press conference as president of the United States, Donald Trump said no fewer than seven times it would be positive, good, even great if, quote, we could get along with Russia. And you say, in fact, for all the confusion of his policies toward China, Europe and the Middle East, Trump has enunciated a clear three-part position on Russia, which contrasts strongly with that of most of the U.S. political elite. Can you talk right now, as uh, we speak today, um, Rex Tillerson, former CEO of ExxonMobil, now Secretary of State, is in Brussels for a major NATO meeting. He almost wasn't there. Um, it was announced he wouldn't be attending NATO, but he would be going later in the month to meet with Russian officials. That disturbed many, and so he ended up in Brussels. But the significance of NATO, uh, Donald Trump's uh, relationship with NATO, and what the U.S.-Russia relationship can be that you perceive? Well, there's a lot in that question. Um, I don't, again, I can't comment on whether he went to Moscow first or Brussels first and exactly what Secretary Tillerson's planning. Uh, my larger point was that, in very simple terms, uh, Trump had said, and again, I outlined it there very simply, um, three things that made sense with regard to Russia, right? That the bad relations we have right now, that we've had for some years, are not solely Russia's fault, but U.S. mistakes have played into it as well. That's first. Second, um, we consequently should meet Russia halfway. And thirdly, that if we do so, then there's a great possibility of cooperation that will benefit both parties, that will benefit the entire world if we can cooperate on issues such as fighting terrorism, a transition in Syria, de-escalating conflict in uh, Ukraine and Central Europe, possibly even cooperating on the Arctic, where, very intriguingly, President Putin of Russia yesterday seemed to propose a meeting in Helsinki um, in May with Donald Trump, kind of a summit centered around the Arctic Council. So my way of thinking, that would be a great venue for a fresh start. But we're not going to get there uh, so long as we have we continue to fight internally over who knew what, who took what fee, um, you know, who did what in the campaign period. We need to get that out there, have these investigations really get to the heart of the matter and not see congressmen and women fighting with each other. And, and, um, and then move past, take whatever corrective or punitive action is necessary, but then get on with foreign policy and not fighting about foreign policy. Professor English, you write, few Russians who endured this corruption and humiliation have much sympathy for U.S. anger over Russian meddling in the 2016 election. With any perspective on the 90s, it's hard to fault them. Can you elaborate on uh, what the U.S. has done in Russia? Sure. Um, now we're going back 20 years or more. Um, but what I wrote in part about in that article was, if we want to understand Russia's point of view, President Putin and those around him, and of course we do, whether or not we agree with it, we need to understand how our adversaries see us, how all other nations see us through their eyes. And if we do that, we realize very quickly that their frame of reference has a lot to do with the mistakes and, yes, the U.S. interference in Russian politics in the 90s, when we directly intervened in a presidential election to boost a losing candidate into a winning position that was Boris Yeltsin, 
and even earlier, when we meddled in parliamentary elections and a constitutional referendum. One way or the other, the U.S. played uh, a meddling, interfering role in Russian politics at that crucial juncture in the 90s that's far greater than what the Russians are alleged to have done now in the 2016 election. Now, two wrongs don't make a right, but again, we need to understand why President Putin, why the political elite in Moscow uh, kind of sees us as acting under a double standard and a lot of hypocrisy um, when we object to their meddling in our elections. Mm. Professor Robert David English, I want to thank you for being with us. Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern California will link to your piece in Foreign Affairs, Russia, Trump and a New Detente. Professor English is the author of Russia and the Idea of the West. This is Democracy Now! We'll move from Russia to uh, Secretary of State Tillerson in Brussels today at NATO, having just come from Turkey. Many are concerned Turkey is uh, making— um, with its new referendum, is leading to a dictatorship. Stay with us. Storms by Calvin here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson's in Brussels for a major meeting on NATO, where he argued the United States is spending a disproportionate share on defense compared with its 27 partners. The meeting follows Tillerson's visit to Turkey yesterday, where he tried to bolster relations with Turkey, despite concerns it's sliding towards a dictatorship. So far during his trip, Tillerson has made no mention of mass arrests of protesters, a purge of opponents that followed last year's failed coup attempt, and a crackdown on the news media. Tillerson's visit comes as Turkey continues to express frustration over U.S. support for Kurdish forces in Syria and Iraq, at the same time it says Kurdish militants are waging an insurgency inside Turkey. This is Tillerson speaking yesterday in Ankara. The United States and Turkey share many broad goals for the region reducing Iran's ability to disrupt the region, finding a settlement in Syria that allows Syrians to return home, and supporting Iraqis to build a strong, independent, and inclusive government in Baghdad. In the United States, the people of Turkey have a trusted ally and a partner who is committed to its safety and security and advancing economic opportunity. We look forward to approaching these challenges together and the Trump administration, administration will continue to build ties with this longstanding ally and our friend. Tillerson's trip to Turkey comes as an executive of Turkey's state-run bank was accused in the United States of conspiring with a Turkish gold trader to evade U.S. sanctions on Iran. The banker may have ties to the Turkish cleric Fethullah Gulen, who lives in exile in the Poconos in Pennsylvania, is blamed by the Turkish president Erdogan for the failed coup. Erdogan is pushed to have Gulen uh, extradited. Back in Turkey, U.S. officials say Tillerson met with the wife of an American pastor who's been jailed since September 
September on terrorism charges related to his alleged links to Gulen. Meanwhile, on April 14th, Turkey set to hold a referendum on a constitutional overhaul that would give sweeping powers to President Erdogan and extend his presidency to 2029. The measure would enable the president to issue decrees, declare emergency rule, appoint ministers and top state officials, and dissolve parliament. Erdogan became president in 2014, after over serving a decade as prime minister. Turkey's also in a dispute with Germany and the Netherlands over their refusal to allow campaign appearances by Turkish officials seeking to raise support for the referendum among Turks who live there. Nearly one and a half million Turks who live in Germany can vote on the measure. Erdogan has called the Dutch, quote, modern-day Nazis and accused Germany's chancellor of Islamophobia and harboring terrorists. On Saturday, several thousand people, including Kurdish protesters, joined a rally in Switzerland's capital, Bern, calling for a no vote on the referendum. Protests were also held over the weekend in Germany. On Sunday, Erdogan lashed out at the protesters. We call the Turkish Republic's president a dictator, but these gentlemen are annoyed when we call them fascists. They are annoyed when we call them Nazis. I'm talking based on documents. Aren't you the ones drawing swastikas on the walls of our mosques? For more, we go to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Connie Shulam, director of the American Kurdish Information Network. Connie, welcome back to Democracy Now! Um, can you talk about Tillerson's visit in the midst of these mass protests around the world on the referendum Erdogan is pushing that would give him enormously expanded power and an enormously extended reign as president? of Turkey. Well, Tillerson went to Turkey to make sure the Injerlik air base could be used against the Islamic State. Uh, but Turkey has a different agenda. Turkey wants the cleric in Pennsylvania to be extradited, and Turkey wants U.S. not to join forces with YPG fighters inside Syria against the Islamic State. And the um, Tillerson says, you know, we want to fight against Daesh, ISIS, uh, we want economic progress in Turkey, we want stability. The problem in Turkey is, um, as Aristotle once put it, for a country to endure, it, it doesn't just need commerce and security, it also needs civic fraternity. And Turkey doesn't have that. You have Turkey at war with a quarter of its population called Kurds. And since the coup attempt, Turkey has dismissed over 130,000 people from their jobs and, and fill them the prisons with them. Uh, over 6,300 academics have been dismissed from their jobs. 15 universities have been closed. Uh, Turkey now has more than half of the world's journalists in jail. And Tillerson didn't even bring these things up. Now, interestingly, Tillerson has, uh, to say the least, um, uh, greatly reduced power as a U.S. Secretary of State, hasn't staffed out the State Department, has uh, applauded President Trump's proposal to slash the State Department. But still, his messages are important, um, from today in NATO to yesterday in Turkey. Um, you mentioned YPG. For people who aren't familiar with Turkish-Kurdish politics, explain um, what you're talking about in Syria, with the U.S. working with Kurdish forces to defeat ISIS, something Erdogan is not very happy about. YPG is a Kurdish militia that is part of or the backbone of the Syrian Democratic Forces that the U.S. has found to be the most effective boots on the ground against the Islamic cutthroats. Turkey has allowed its border to be used as a way station for over 35,000 foreign fighters to cross it, to go into Syria with the hopes of toppling Assad, with the hopes of turning Syria into a Turkish satellite state. The plans didn't work out. Then there was this monstrosity called Islamic State, and the U.S. found out that Turkey was not really serious about them. Uh, Turkey was supporting uh, uh, Syrian uh, Freedom, uh, Free Syrian Army, whose uh, forces are uh, happy to shout Allahu Akbar, and then ISIS fighters shout Allahu Akbar. So you cannot have two fighters, two groups fighting each other, uh, claiming God is great. They, they, U.S. basically found out that you cannot really accomplish this goal. The YPG is fighting and is uh, because 
uh, Daesh Islamic State has been kidnapping Kurdish women, has been selling them as sex slaves. So for the Kurds, it's an existential war. And U.S., to its credit, has, uh, during Obama, supported them. During Trump, the support level has gone up, actually, and wants the Islamic State to be degraded and destroyed and thinks that YPG is the force to do it. And very quickly, this referendum, what it would mean for Erdogan in increasing his power? For example, there are 28 important judges for life in Turkey. Erdogan would be appointing 18 of them, and the remaining rump Turkish parliament would appoint 10 of them. For example, Erdogan, if he doesn't like the parliament, he could just uh, run the country by decrees. For example, Erdogan would have the power over uh, the budget process. Erdogan would basically be a sultan, would be an absolute ruler. And if he doesn't, if the opposition doesn't like him, the parliament doesn't like him, he could just dissolve it. Very quickly, we have 30 seconds. Can you talk about the case of Zara Doğan, the Kurdish artist arrested last week for her painting depicting the Turkish military operations in the city of Mardin? Well, the city was Nusaybin. Uh, last year, the city was totally destroyed. The Turkish military took a photo of it, almost like an aerial photo, and distributed on its Twitter feed. This woman, Zehra Doğan, downloaded it and then made a painting of it and then put it on her Instagram. And guess what? The judge just gave her two years, uh, ten, uh, two years, 10 months and 22 days in jail for uh, making PKK propaganda. I mean, this is a picture they took. She just simply painted it. And for that, now she's in jail. We have to leave it there, but we'll continue to follow all of this. Connie Shulam, director of the American Kurdish Information Network, thanks for joining us. When we come back, we speak to two immigrants justice uh, activists in Vermont who were just released after more than a week held by ICE in jail. Stay with us. Still here by Carla Morrison here on Democracy Now, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Are immigra um, immigration agents targeting undocumented organizers for their political work? That's the question many are asking after three prominent immigrant rights activists in Vermont were jailed by ICE in what local organizers are calling a clear case of political retaliation. 24-year-old Enrique Bacazar and 23-year-old Suli Palacios were freed on Monday after spending 11 days in jail. Both are leaders of the group Migrant Justice in Vermont. They were arrested by undercover ICE agents in Burlington, Vermont, earlier this month as they were leaving the Migrant Justice Office. Balcazar, who is known as Kike, serves on Vermont Attorney General T.J. Donovan's Immigration Task Force, which was created to respond to the Trump administration's immigration policies. A third activist with migrant justice. 23-year-old Cesar Alex Carrillo remains jailed. He was arrested by ICE outside a courthouse two days before Zuli and Kike were arrested. In a moment, we'll go to Boston to speak with their lawyer, Matt Cameron. But first, let's turn to Kike and Zuli themselves. On Thursday, I sat down with them, two days after they returned home to Vermont. I began by asking Zuli Palacios about how long she spent in jail. Eleven days. It was the 11 longest days of my life. I will never forget it. Can you describe the conditions of your detention, where you were held the longest, and what it was like in that jail? The first time they took me to the jail here in Vermont, it's a place where no human being should be, because you're completely enclosed. It was very small space, and it was practically torture, psychological torture. I had no contact with anyone. I was captive there by myself, one tiny window. And just me in the darkness. It was horrible. 
Las puertas sonaban a cada rato. And I could hear these doors slamming all the time. I couldn't see the other prisoners. I was without communication of any type. Kike Balcazar, could you talk about your detention? Um, you were held separately from Suli? Yes, unfortunately, it was really an attack against the communities with the new administration of President Donald Trump. He's really attacking the immigrant communities. What happened to Zuli and myself and Alex, who is still in jail, was very sad experience. The way they are persecuting the community and people who have no criminal records, who are merely defending our rights. We believe in the values of the United States. We believe in this country and we have a beautiful community in the States. From the moment they detained us, we were very nervous. We had no idea what was happening. At first, we didn't know who these people were. We were terrorized, really. Then they separated us. I spent 36 hours in Swanton, where I had no contact. They wouldn't let me make any phone calls until I could finally contact my lawyer after demanding it. I wasn't able to get through to him. Everything we went through there was very sad for Zuli and myself. It was basically torture for us. It's really sad what they're doing to innocent people there. Can you talk, uh, Kike, about the Milk with Dignity campaign that you co-founded two years ago? How are you organizing? What have you been organizing around in Vermont? In Vermont, there is a united community. We work in the dairy industry, and we know that they are, like all over the world, violation of human rights, things we really do not want to endure. So we organize, and we meet in the community, talk about the problems we are facing, and issues of health, and so on. So now we are in a campaign which started based on community priorities, after having had meetings and doing inquiries in the community about what people wanted to do. We created the Milk with Dignity campaign, which is to guarantee our human rights, to get human rights for dairy workers, in terms of wages, work hours, and living conditions. We do hold the big companies responsible, because they are getting rich off of us, the immigrants in that state. One of the companies um, that you have targeted is Ben & Jerry's, uh, based in Vermont. What has been Ben & Jerry's response, and what are you demanding of them, Kike? Claro, eh, nosotros después de, de aprender del modelo exitoso de the Fair Food program. After we learned about the successful model of the Fair Food Program in Florida, which guarantees human rights, which has won human rights for the workers, we identified with that. So we were able to identify the big companies in Vermont. Ben & Jerry's is a big company, an ice cream company, and it was founded in Vermont and is known all over the world. They have a philosophy of social justice, which is good cual es muy bueno, pero eh, no tiene eh, protecciones para los que hacemos el trabajo desde ahí. But there were no protections for dairy workers, Entonces, people working with cattle. So two years ago, we started talking with them, and we had a meeting. In the beginning, it was really difficult to get them to the table. We started talking about immigration, worker, and labor issues. Al principio fue muy difícil. Nos botaban de la mesa, que no teníamos nada que hacer ahí, que eran cosas de labor, que eran cosas de inmigración. Y nosotros insistimos hasta llegar a una campaña donde firmar un acuerdo de corporación. Eventually, we had a campaign where we got them to sign an agreement to make the program of human rights a reality. It took two years, and we were still negotiating, but we would like them to sign a contract with us and to finish this and guarantee our human rights in Vermont. Do you feel, Suli, that you were targeted because of your organizing, um, or simply uh, because you overstayed your visa in the United States? Eh. I am sure that they sought me out because of the work I am doing to defend human rights and not for anything else, because they 
What they wanted to do was get into the community and intimidate us that way, but they're not going to succeed. We will never stop defending human rights. There is discussion in Vermont of using prisoners to work on dairy farms um, if immigrants like yourselves are being targeted. Can you respond to this? Uh, can you tell us what the situation is, Kike? Es triste, es triste lo que toda esta administración ha traído como a la mesa, ¿no? Eh, hablar de poner It's really sad, everything that this administration has brought to the table. Talking about having prisoners work on the dairy farms is completely unjust to the people. They don't deserve that. That's a labor exploitation. And that's returning us to the times of slavery. So when we talk about protecting people, we have been working for years to keep this industry afloat. So it's a completely unjust idea. Finally, I wanted to ask you each, you are both now in removal proceedings. Will that affect your work, your organizing in Vermont, while you remain free? And let's begin with Suli. Como ya había mencionado As esto I anteriormente, said earlier, el haber pasado por esta experiencia having me hizo más had this experience has made me stronger. And we will keep, I will keep working. I'm going to keep moving forward for all of us so that we can stay and be part of this community in the United States and this community in Vermont. It affects me, but in a positive way. I'm stronger for having been through this. I'm not afraid. I'm going to and I, I feel stronger, and I'm going to keep fighting until we win. Your feelings when you were freed, Suli? Pues, eh, fue un momento en la que me sentía alegre de volver a ver. I felt very happy at that amigos, moment to be able to see my friends again día, and see daylight again, but I also felt very sad because de la cárcel, in jail. Tan lindas, tan I thought about uh, there were all kinds meses, of great people. Meses, innocent people who've been there for months and months who don't know what's going to happen to them. So I felt sad for them because I got out, but they're still there. And when I left there, I wish they could have gone with me. So that makes me sad. So I felt it was a mixture of sadness and happiness. Because a lot of innocent people, parents, mothers, they can't see their children, and separating a family is, is terrible. They need to be free. And Kike Pacasar, if you could share your final message with people, especially other immigrants who might be watching and listening right now, uh, about what this means and how people can protect themselves. And also, if you could comment on the solidarity uh, that was expressed in your cases, both for you, who are both freed, you and Suli, and for Alex, who's still behind bars. Claro. Primero, este, quiero dar el número de Ben and Jerry's. Como mencioné, estamos en la campaña Leche con Dignidad, entonces todavía no tenemos cerrado un acuerdo. First of all, I want to give the number of Ben and Jerry's. We still have not signed an agreement with them. I invite everyone to call Ben and Jerry's and tell them that they have to sign that agreement with the dairy workers. I insist. El número es 802. The number is 802-846-1500. So it would be a great show of solidarity with us if you would call Ben and Jerry's and tell them to sign an agreement with us. For my community all over the country, fear is not an option. This administration is trying to force us back into the shadows. They are intimidating people. They are trying to make police collaborate with immigration. It's completely unjust for us. So I ask the community, don't give in to fear. Let's not be afraid. Let's defend our rights. We want to be part of this community all over the country and defend our rights always. Let's not lose faith. Let's not lose hope. That's my message that I want to send to all the Latin American compañeros all over the world. Siempre que no perdamos la fe y que nos organicemos siempre. 
Entonces, ese es el mensaje que yo quiero We are confronting very bad times in this country, and for sure fear exists, but that's not a barrier for us defending our rights and changing this. That's Enrique Pacazar. Uh, his nickname is Quique, and Sule Palacios. We spoke to him on Thursday, just days after they were freed Monday after spending 11 days in jail. As we go right now to Boston to speak with Matt Cameron, immigration attorney, managing partner of Cameron Law Offices in Boston, representing the migrant justice organizers. Matt, welcome to Democracy Now! Explain what they've been charged with and why Alex Carrillo is still in jail. Thank you, Amy. Good to be with you. Uh, these, I think it's very important to understand, as in all removal proceedings, are civil charges. There's no crime here. They've been charged with, uh, respectively, in Zoli's case, overstaying a visa, and, and, uh, and Kike's case, and being here without permission, and same with Alex. And uh, Alex does remain in jail uh, with no bond, due to a case that was dismissed in Vermont, that the Vermont State's Attorney's Office did not see fit to prosecute, in their prosecutorial discretion, withheld prosecution, and actually allowed him to go free. And the federal government immediately picked him up, and uh, he was denied any opportunity for bond after that. Out to Immigration's Customs Enforcement to ICE to talk about the cases of, uh, of Enrique and Sully and Alex and their arrests. ICE spokesman for New England, Sean Niedauer, said ICE does not target individuals based on political beliefs or activism. The reasons for the recent arrests in Vermont have already been addressed publicly. On March 15th, ICE officers arrested a 23 year old Mexican national who was charged locally with a DUI and self admitted to federal authorities. He unlawfully entered the U.S. Two days later, ICE arrested a female foreign national, who surpassed the duration of a lawful visit by nearly a year, and another individual who was with her in the vehicle at the time and who also has an active immigration violation. These were lawful arrests and conducted completely within ICE's legal authority under federal law, unquote. That's the statement of ICE. Matt Cameron, if you could respond. That is the statement of ICE. Uh, but that forgets a long, long history in this country of political targeting of non-citizens and the use of the deportation system to achieve our ideological and political means. And I believe uh, you can hear it. Uh, my clients are perfectly capable of advocating for themselves. They just did. What we just heard is exactly why they were in custody for 11 days, because they have a very powerful message for their fellow workers, for their fellow undocumented, and uh, for the country. And I, I think that's really what brought them to attend to immigration's radar. So, can you say how this meshes with President Trump saying he's going to go after, um, you know, drug uh, drug gang members and terrorists? And basically, as he says, bad hombres, uh, but not talking about these status violations. No, it, it, it in no way. I, I, now, Trump, of course, has broadened the enforcement priorities so that they can catch anyone in the field that they encounter. But I've seen the arrest reports. I heard the government's argument in court, and these were extremely targeted. These these two were hunted down by immigration. This was a long investigation. They were surveilled. They were harassed. They were followed, and. Uh, They were arrested. And there's a five page arrest report in each case detailing this investigation. So I don't understand at all how this is an appropriate use of federal resources when there are only 5,000 ICE agents out in the field and 12 to 16 million undocumented people. Why would you start with Vermont farm workers? Why would you start especially with those who are fighting for better working conditions and for safety standards? What chance do they have of remaining in the United States and Alex of getting out of uh, an ICE jail? Well, I don't want to comment too much on what's coming. Uh, we have a lot of questions that the government's going to need to answer. But uh, Alex especially is eligible to immigrate through a marriage visa. We've just filed that, and uh, we're hoping that's going to be expedited. And he's going to have to go back to Mexico to process that. It's a very long road. There's nothing quick about it, especially uh, given his circumstances. There's a misconception, I think, that just because he has a U.S. citizen wife and child that this should be easy or fast, but that's certainly not the case. Matt Cameron, I want to thank you for being with us, immigration attorney uh, in Boston, representing uh, migrant justice organizers Sully Palacios and Enrique Bacasar. This is Democracy Now! That does it for our broadcast. A very happy birthday to Mike Burke. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermin Shea, Carla Wills, Laura Gattis, Dina Sam Malkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Trina Dura, and Andre Lewis. We have a job opening for a news fellow. Go to our website, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.